This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Today's episode features a roundtable discussion on the series Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. Joining us are the editors, Jungian analyst Dr. Murray Stein in Zurich, Switzerland, and initiatic therapist Dr. Thomas Arst in Germany's Black Forest. The publisher, psychiatrist Dr. Stephen Buser in Asheville, North Carolina, and a distinguished author in the series, physician and scholar Dr. Lance Owens at the University of Utah. Please visit speakingofjung.com for full biographies and links on each of today's guests. This episode was recorded on Wednesday, September 18th, 2019, through the magic of Skype. Dr. Stein, let's start with you. Tell us what the Red Book is. I'm sure a lot of the listening audience has heard of it, uh, knows of it, maybe has it and has read it, but there have been some misconceptions in the pop culture about what it is. So let's begin with what is the Red Book? The Red Book is a big book. <laughs> it's a big, heavy book. Um, it's a book that was published in 2009, but uh, that is some some 100 years after its uh, conception and uh, completion by Carl Jung. <clears throat> Let me just say a few words about my experience with the history of the Red Book and its publication as by way of introduction. Um, when I trained at the Jung Institute in around 1970, <clears throat> um, everybody, uh, the teachers and the students all knew that there was such a thing as the Red Book in existence, but nobody had seen it, with very, very few exceptions. Mary Louise von Franz had seen it, and Barbara Hanna had seen it, but very few people had actually put their hands on it or uh, seen what it uh, actually looked like. But we could read about it, and we knew uh, some of the story from Chapter 6 of Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung's autobiography, which he published with the help of Aniele Jaffe in 1961. And uh, we knew uh, that it was the story of a, of a midlife transformation process that he experienced after he broke uh, his relationship uh, with Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis and set off on his own path to create analytical psychology in 1913. But there were a lot of rumors about it. What else was in it besides what he told us in Memories, Dreams, Reflections? And these rumors were wild. Uh, everything from uh, Jung really was crazy and went mad, and it's, it would... Uh, the reason the Red Book will never be published uh, is his family won't allow it because it would ruin his reputation uh, and stories about how he thought of himself as a uh, savior of the world and so on. Um, so um, uh, there were a lot of questions. Uh, what actually happened to Jung in that period that he calls confrontation with the unconscious? Um, <clears throat> Henry Ellenberger had written about it as a uh, creative illness. Uh, other people had th thought of it as a psychotic period in Jung's life. Um, uh, and so there were a lot of um, uh, rumors and questions. And occasionally in the 1990s, I would have lunch with Ulrich Herney, Jung's grandson, who was coming up in the ranks of the Jung family and would eventually take over the job of um, uh, uh, seeing what can be published and what can't be published out, out of Jung's archives when his uh, predecessor, Franz Jung, Jung's son, uh, would pass away. And in the late 60s, I think it was 1996, Franz Jung did pass away, and Ulrich Herney took over the job. Uh, while Franz Jung was alive, he did not allow the Red Book to be published. He didn't think it would be appropriate. And there were many people who agreed with him, and the family at that time agreed with him. But when Ulrich Herney took it over, um, uh, I, I could sense in our conversations when I would say to him, you know, there's really a lot of interest in this. Isn't it possible to get it published? I could sense there was some wiggle room, and they were beginning to consider the possibility. Of course, they do all this very privately, and uh, uh, he never told me how the project was coming along until 
finally, I heard that there was a movement uh, to get it published and that um, Sonar Shamdasani had been uh, selected to edit the book and to uh, make the footnotes and write an introduction and so on. And so gradually, um, we got wind that uh, the book would be published. And when I was president of the IAP uh, in 2004, we had a Congress in Barcelona and invited uh, Sonar Sham Dasani to give a talk about his work on the Red Book, because by that time it was known that it would be published. And uh, a publisher had not yet been found or chosen for the job, but he was busy with the editing. And he told us a few things about it, showed us some pictures and so on. And so the excitement was building, but it would still be another five years before uh, the publication would actually take place. And I'm sure those were years of intense uh, scholarly activity on Sonu Shamdasani's part because he's done a wonderful job with the editing and the footnotes and his introduction uh, is a very fine piece of work. There was a great deal of difficulty in finding a publisher that that would do it justice. Uh, I know they tried several. Uh, they were disappointed in what was being proposed. And then um, it turned out that Nancy Ferlotti uh, got um, some information about a, a, an editor at Norton in New York who was interested in doing uh, big picture books and had some interest in Jung. Uh, and so through Nancy Ferlotti, a contact was made, and uh, eventually uh, Norton signed the contract to make a facsimile uh, edition of the Red Book, a beautiful, uh, very carefully photographed facsimile of exactly uh, what the pages in the Red Book look like, and that that would be published in uh, with the text and uh, commentaries and footnotes and so on. And then in 2009, it was published to a lot of uh, interest and excitement. I remember reading in the newspapers that Nancy Pelosi uh, in Congress, uh, as she was getting ready to go on Christmas vacation, said she couldn't wait to get home. She wanted to read Jung's Red Book over the vacation. Um, and that's what I did over that Christmas vacation in 2009. I got a copy of the English translation and of the German version. Uh, I found the German version um, a more uh, uh, a better read than the English translation, although the English translation is fine. Uh, but it reads better in German. That's That was Jung's language, and that's what he was working in. Um, and I read through it over the Christmas holidays and made careful notes. Um, and I read it as though it were a uh, an epic, uh, a literary work. Uh, I was an English major um, in college, and so um, I read it with the uh, with uh, with an eye to what is the trajectory? Where is this work going? Where does it start? How does it build? Who are the characters? What is the story? And what does this all mean as a as a piece of literature? <clears throat> and I spent um, uh, several weeks on that over the holidays, and then I. Um, uh, brought Steve Buser into the picture. And Steve and I had been doing some webinars with uh, the Asheville Young Center. Uh, and we worked out a plan to do a couple of webinars on the Red Book. And uh, those were actually photographed and there are DVDs of uh, what I made of the Red Book at that time. And I found it to be a, a fascinating work, very complex work, difficult to read. I didn't like it particularly at first. It was hard to get into. There are scenes and and uh, there's commentary in it that I thought um, was not uh, um, not to my taste. Uh, but gradually it grew on me, and I came to understand what uh, Jung was struggling with more and more. After that uh, publication, there were a lot of conferences, um, essays were written, uh, journals were devoted to. Uh, commentaries on the Red Book, and uh, and so in the uh, years from 2010 to 12, 13, and there, uh, there was a lot of attention given to it, and then that attention more or less died down. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, uh, it's going to take some time to digest this work and assimilate it. 
Uh, the question was, will it simply be put aside as a kind of aberration on Jung's part? This was a part of his life when he was struggling with his personal myth, and it's a kind of personal journey that we read about in the Red Book, his own individuation process in his midlife period between the ages of 37 and 45, roughly. And um, Or will it be taken up into the Jungian corpus uh, and put on the shelf with the collected works, perhaps even under the collected works as foundational to the collected works, at least the volumes after number five in the collected works. Um, and that was an open question. And uh, I think to some extent it still is, although it's becoming more and more clear as time goes on, and certainly the other speakers today will, will address that, that uh, it's coming more and more to the fore as foundational, and that when one reads Jung's later writings, one can often find passages that are very clear echoes of um, uh, uh, paragraphs or or scenes in the Red Book or or descriptions of his experience during that time. And Jung himself says in his autobiography that in that period. He, uh, he discovered the prima materia, the material that would be essential for his later work and um, for his um, creation of what we know as analytical psychology. Um, fast forward now to 2016 or so, I was teaching at the um, uh, International School of Analytical Psychology in, in Zurich and um, uh, a man named Thomas Arzt was in the uh, in the in the audience, and he asked to have lunch with me one day. So we went and had a, a very pleasant lunch in a local restaurant, and he made a proposal. He said, "Why don't we consider asking a number of Jungian scholars to write essays on on the Red Book?" Um, um, uh, he found it, and he will speak for himself in a moment, uh, a work of not only great interest, but profound meaning uh, for our times and, and certainly for the Jungian uh, project around the world, a, a very important book. And at first I was a bit hesitant because I had heard, heard a number of different reactions to the Red Book on the part of my colleagues. Some liked it, some didn't. Some thought it should not be made too much of. Um, uh, others felt otherwise. At first I was hesitant and I thought, uh, hasn't enough been said about the Red Book uh, in all these conferences and articles already? But then I slept on it and I thought, well, we could give it a try. Uh, and so um, between the two of us, we came up with the title, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, uh, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. And Thomas will explain to you what that subtitle particularly means in just a moment. Um, but to, uh, to take a look at the Red Book, uh, not so much for its historical value or what it meant for Jung's later creative work in his in his uh, writings after um, he had this experience, but um, a kind of hermeneutic for our time. Does the Red Book have something to say to us uh, who are living a hundred years after Jung created the Red Book? Is it still relevant? And if so, how is it relevant? And so uh, we wrote letters of invitation to um, I think 30 or 40 authors and got a very positive response. Um, that yes, they would be happy to contribute, they were interested. Uh, and so suddenly we realized, well, we've got more than one volume on our hands. Um, we're going to have to think big <laughs> and make this a series. And so that's how the um, idea came about. And we approached Steve Buser, the um, uh, publisher and editor of Chiron Publications, to see if they would be interested in being the publisher. And so um, I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Thomas Arts, who will uh, add a few things to what I've said, and then maybe uh, Dr. Buser could also come in from a publisher's point of view.
Yeah, thanks, uh, Marie, for your description of the history or how the whole project evolved. Um, there is a little history prior to our meeting point in that nice restaurant in Zurich uh, that I would like to explain. Um, I basically live in two realms. Um, one is connected to a spiritual retreat center here in Germany in the Black Forest, uh, founded in the 50s by Graf Dürkheim, Count Dürkheim, and his wife, Countess Dürkheim. And I worked there since 30 years. Uh, I had the pleasure, bliss, and horror of experiencing my own individuation process there. And after I came out of it, <clears throat> we started to do, to set up um, publications, um, <clears throat> conferences, symposia. Um, the retreat center is based on two pillars. Uh, one pillar is connected to the Zen tradition and the other to Jungian psychotherapy. So when I received my copy of the Red Book in 2009, um, we had the idea of creating workshops in that retreat center in the Black Forest. We would do readings of certain chapters. We would do discussions of what this was all about what it meant to the people who were in the workshop. And then we would, at the same time, uh, do active imaginations. People would paint them. Um, their dreams would be discussed and analyzed. And <clears throat> whenever we finished those retreats, I was amazed how much the work, the, the, the Red Book as a resource as a template for soul searching would be, would initiate, let's say average people out of German population in going deeper and um, doing their own soul searching process. That is one realm I, I live in. The other one is that on a business level, I um, run a company that does um, Consulting and Strategic Foresight, which is uh, more on the political side or the consulting of companies. And when I talk to, let's say, the policy makers and the decision makers, I sense a lot of confusion uh, with respect to the dynamics, volatility and uncertainty uh, our society lives in. So <clears throat> both impressions that I just described, led to the idea that this wonderful, highly complex, uh, beautiful work has a very, very special meaning or could have a very special meaning for our time um, <clears throat> that I don't need to tell you is a very confusing time whenever you watch news. Um, when you look into your everyday life, everybody's confused without a direction and people think they live on a Titanic. So the Red Book, in a certain sense, is a remedy for me, introducing the idea of an individuation process beyond the or besides the dynamics we live in um, and will have to live in for a lot of more years in my opinion. And what is interesting to see is, number one, the Red Book was um, created by Jung in those years when Max Weber created the notion of the iron cage of modernity. <clears throat> that modernity is kind of a polar night of icy darkness, which nicely corresponds to Jung's dark night of the soul. It happened at the same time in the 1910s and 1920s, a time that is was full of crisis as our time is today too. And the second issue is that the Red Book popped up in 2009 in a beautiful act of synchronicity when the world was close to a financial meltdown 
in the aftermath of the Lehman Brothers crisis. So that is on a, let's say, level of the ideas, of the, of the history of ideas, um, an impressive synchronicity that these things come up whenever the world is in danger. Um, as another example, that the Nakamadi um, <clears throat> copies were found after the disaster of World War II. So if you look at this, these phenomena in a holistic way, the Red Book is, Murray and me, we declared it as part of the Aurea Catena of uh, imaginative literature, um, very important for mankind. Um, it can give us ideas of what is about to come in the future, and that is basically our idea, maybe our mission, to transport and convey the Red Book more into the public domain. Yes, and I would like to say that as co-editors, Dr. Stein, Dr. Ards, you've written the introduction to each of the volumes, and I don't believe that we've talked about how this progressed. So the first volume was published in 2017, the second volume last year, the third volume this year. You say that volume four is in the works, and volume five will be next year's Aranos Conference Lectures. That's would, right. Yes. Yeah, so would you tell us a little bit about that? And then Dr. Buser, I'd like you to come in and tell us about the publishing process and how you managed to get what will be in total 90 essays. Yeah, as I just said, Murray and I, we sit down on a regular basis in Zurich. We have lunch together. And once this project got underway, we're always thinking about new possibilities, new options to, um, let's say, spread the word how important we consider um, Jung's Red Book today as a resource or a template for people who are confused to <clears throat> take a deeper look at this, at the source of their own spiritual life. So. We come up with ideas. We initiated a um, symposium at um, ISAP in Zurich. Um, we have new ideas. And one idea that we had then had, I think, Murray, it was in spring, that we would approach the Aranos Foundation right, yes. um, and propose uh, to take the topic there. And it worked out well. Um, Eranos Foundation, uh, as you know, is a very famous place in the history of ideas of the 20th century. I was there last week. It's beautiful. The environment is beautiful. The place has still its soul. You can see Jung, Corbin, and all the other light towers sitting there. And it's the right place to strike up a conference on our topic. Um, that, will, that will take place in April of 2020 uh, with Ricardo Bernardini, who is the um, uh, executive director of the Arnos Foundation now, and uh, Joseph Cambry, who is the president of Pacifica Graduate Institute uh, on the uh, planning committee. We're organizing this together. We meet regularly and we will have I think it's 17 speakers over the course of uh, three and a half days um, at the Aranos Foundation and at Monte Verita in Ascona. And that's located in Switzerland. In Switzerland, right, yes. Right, for those who aren't familiar. And Jung has a long history with that conference as well. Jung lectured there from its beginnings in 1933 invited by Olga Frebe Kapitan, who was the organizer of it and the, and the financial backer. And uh, Jung lectured there from 1933 until I think 1952 was his last year there. Um, and he became the, the center of the Aranos gathering. Uh, the Aranos conferences were a collection of world-class um, scholars, in uh, the history of religions. Marcia Eliade, for instance, uh, lectured there, Gershom Sholem, 
uh, many famous people. Paul Tillich uh, was there. Um, and Jung was a constant presence. He was there every year from uh, its beginning until his old age, and he could no longer manage the uh, the trip. Um, and he he gave a lecture almost every year. Those are contained in his collected works, yeah. In his collected works, yes. And both you, Dr. Stein, and Dr. Arzt, uh, will be speaking there, as well as Dr. Owens, who we have not heard from yet. And I do believe also the co-publisher at Chiron Publications, Dr. Leonard Cruz, will be there as well. That's right. So, Dr. Buser, uh, we would like to hear from you what the publishing process has been like with this series. Yeah, certainly. The story, from my perspective, has been one of the Red Book surprising me on regular yeah, occasions. My story with Dr. Stein goes back to 2008 when he and I had the idea to put together what's now the Asheville Young Center, where we were hosting lectures primarily you know, from Zurich, you know, Switzerland, on online to you know, host lectures you know, throughout the world. And at the time, we were the only ones doing that, doing the online education from a Jungian perspective. And from early on, it really took off you know, with that. And people from around the world were tuning in you know, for it. In 2009, Murray told me about the Red Book you know, coming out and that he'd like to you know, host a lecture on it. And I was excited, but I don't think I understood the gravity of what was about to happen when... The Red Book came out in late 2009. Dr. Stein put together the lecture within probably a month, maybe two. So by January of 2010, yeah, he had digested the Red Book you know, enough to give just a marvelous lecture you know, on it. And again, we were one of the very first to, to lecture to that degree on it. And we went from maybe 50 to 100 participants in our you know, first number of lectures in 2008, 2009, to over 700 participants for the Red Book, you know, lecture. And that shocked us, you know, so much so that it was hard to to have the servers and the bandwidth and and, and have the, the system even function with that many people simultaneously signing in and that early on before these kind of webinars were widely acknowledged. And I think that's part of the tapping into the deep energy of the Red Book. The Red Book is so archetypal, so numinous, that when it bursts forth, it, it bursts forth with the power with that. We then did a number of other lectures on it, probably four or five altogether. And there was interest, but it slowly weaned down to some degree. So we had maybe 300 participants the next time. And after a year or two, we were getting back to the 50 or 100 you know, mark. So in 2017, when Dr. Stein approached me about the Red Book series, you know, the Red Book for our time, at, at that point, I was skeptical, you know, to be honest, that you know, maybe the the energy has, has waned you know, from that, that people are not necessarily tired, but aren't you know, as enthusiastic you know, about you know, the Red Book. Yeah, may not be you know, reading as much about it. Nonetheless, you know, Dr. Stein and Dr. Arts were very enthusiastic about the, the project. And I've learned after working with Dr. Stein for the last 10 years that when he has deep excitement and enthusiasm in a project, usually he's right. His, yes. <laughs> his gut intuition is tapped into something. So I suspended my own disbelief and said, well, sure, let's let's do this. Let's write this series. And I'll be darned if yet again, I was surprised. And the interest in the series of books has been really phenomenal. People have really been excited about it. The authors have been enthusiastic about writing their chapters. And the fact that Dr. Arts and Dr. Stein are getting a thick volume every year you know, published together just tells you the momentum that this series has. I mean, very few book series can can publish you know, every year you know, like that. But they've just done a marvelous job in pulling this together. You know, we really tried to fast track it to you know, get it in print and get it up there. And people have been you know, very responsive to it. We've been really delighted. 
I would just like to add that each volume is a collection of essays. Each chapter is an essay, and they're not written just by Jungian analysts, but also by scholars and psychotherapists as well. And from all over the world, not just the United States, but also from Europe and Israel, China, Japan. It's, That's right. Yes, it's this historic collection of essays. And some of the past guests of this podcast, such as fa- the late Father Dorley, Russ Lockhart, Gary Sparks, uh, are all have all contributed chapters. Dr. Buser, would you just tell us a little bit about Chiron Publications? I I had always known it as, um, because I live here in Chicago, that Dr. Stein and Dr. Schwartz-Salant, another guest of this podcast, uh, started the company and then um, sold it to you and Dr. Leonard Cruz in Asheville, North mm-hmm. Carolina. And would you just tell us a little bit about what what else you publish? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Chiron Publications has a really long, rich history within the Jungian you know, community. And you're quite right, Dr. Stein and Dr. Schwartz Salant you know, began Chiron Publications probably 35 years or so you know, now ago. And, and it began actually from a series of conferences in Ghost Ranch that uh, Dr. Stein and Dr. Schwartz Salant were publishing the, the you know, writings you know, from. But it quickly grew into a, a larger you know, venture where you know, Jungian you know, titles from authors around the world were being published. It was based out of Chicago for the, the first you know, number of years. Well, Matt, you know, I believe. And then later, Dr. Stein moved to, to Zurich, Switzerland, and it was sort of a hybrid between Chicago and, and Zurich. Then in 2013, Dr. Stein approached me uh, as he and I had been working together for a number of years with the Asheville Young Center and suggested that Dr. Cruz, my publishing partner, and I you know, take over, you know, Chiron. Um, yet again, I was skeptical at first. Yeah, I'm a psychiatrist and busy private practice. Thought, oh my goodness, how can I add another venture you know, onto this? I have two young kids. This is going to be quite a challenge. Um, but we took the leap and 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 took over, you know, Chiron. And I must say, it's been a delight, you know, as well, seeing these these books. Yeah, you know, come to fruition has been just a, a wonderful experience. And currently, we publish probably twelve to fifteen titles a year. So it's a very robust yeah you know, company, at least from a for that that niche of Jungian you know, world. And we've gotten to travel to Vienna for the IAP conference. We've gone to Zurich for the Zurich le- lecture series. And we get to engage with these really top-notch Jungian authors from around the world and see just exciting new ideas you know, coming forth. We did branch out in some other areas. We've gone a little bit clinical. We did a book on the DSM-5. That's been a very good seller. And we even went into the foray of politics and have done a number of books on President Trump and narcissism and you know, archetypal you know, elements that we've had some concern about over the last number of years. Uh, so we're trying to expand it in some some new ways as well. And I wanted to ask you the webinars that Dr. Stein mentioned um, that he did with you for the Asheville Young Center, are those still available online? Yes, absolutely. AshevilleYoungCenter.org yeah, is you know, where those are housed. And all of the, the prior seminars are available both on web streaming or DVD. And the Red Book series in particular are really some of my absolute favorites with that. Yeah, Dr. Stein just beautifully lays out you know, the elements of the, the Red Book. And if you're going to try to read the Red Book and, and delve into it for your own unconscious material, having a overview of the material, you know, such as Dr. Stein's lecture, is really helpful to do so. Yes, I, I would agree. And I will provide links to those on the Speaking of Jung episode mm-hmm, page. Mm-hmm. Dr. Owens, I would like to bring you in now. Uh, you contributed the chapter C.G. Jung and the Prophet Puzzle in Volume 1. And I was wondering if you would say a few words about that and your connection with this series. I'd be glad to. First of all, I, I want to express my gratitude to Murray and to Thomas and to, you know, to, to Chiron for getting these books done. Um, I, I authored an essay for the first volume, but I saw none of the other essays in that volume until my volume arrived. 
And the night it arrived, I sat by the fire uh, for uh, five hours. I had to go out for extra wood several times um, and read. And I was just delighted. It was it was a conversation with people who had an interest similar to my own. They had new insights. They had different takes on things than I had. And I was delighted, absolutely delighted. And that goes for the second volume as well. Uh, it's just, I mean, this is what was needed. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say to, that my response to the Red Book was a bit different than Murray's. Um, uh, I, I had been introduced to Jung, you know, th over 30 years ago now, 35, by uh, a dear friend who remains one of my dearest friends, Dr. Stephen Heller in Los Angeles, who had written a book called uh, C.G. Uh, Jung and the Seven Sermons to the Dead, or actually the title was The Gnostic Jung and the Seven Sermons to the Dead. And at the very beginning of my study of Jung, uh, Stefan Heller had become a dear friend of mine. His lectures were excellent. And in my introduction to Jung, in my very first year of reading Jung, the Gnostic Jung and the Seven Sermons to the Dead were part of it. And my conversations, frequent and intense conversations, were set from with Stefan Heller were part of it. And I was convinced pretty early on that Jung had undergone this experience talked about in Memories, Dreams, Reflections in this period from 1913 on through, you know, 1920 or so, or a bit more, uh, that was visionary, that was intense, and that all of his subsequent works, as he said, in memory streams, reflections, and made clear in other ways, had blossomed forward from those experiences. And so from the beginning, when I started reading Jung, and over my first year and a half or so of my Jung study, I read all of the collected works, I was continually reading the collected works back into that period. I was fascinated by the Red Book. I thought there was probably no chance I would ever see it in my lifetime. But I had been reading the collected works, looking back into this period in Jung's life. And I found evidence upon evidence of things that I was sure were speaking back to that experience. And, of course, I never thought I'd have any evidence to, to complete that, <laughs> that intuition, uh, realize uh, whether or not my intuitions were correct. And uh, when, when the Red Book was published on October, October 9th, I think it was, of 2009, Sonu Shamdasani gave his introductory lecture at the uh, uh, New York Academy of Medicine. At the very end of that lecture, he said, um, I would say that I feel quite certain in 10 years hence, and here we are 10 years hence, this will indeed transform our understanding of Jung, such that no one will bother with the biographical literature of the previous period, and there will be a whole new translation of Jung's scholarship. I am certain this will completely transform the understanding of Jung, unquote. And uh, I got my copy at that time. I went home and I read it. And when I opened it up, it was like, this is exactly what I expected. This was what I had been looking for. I, it was not surprising at all to me. This is what I had been reading back into for all those years. I think probably on my second reading or so, I the thing that am amazed me is I didn't understand how deeply into the darkness the man had gone. And the fir in my first reading, I skipped over some of that material, that those visions he had in January of 1914, some of those very, very dark things. And then on my second reading, it just, it once again, I mean, I was just, I, I shook. I really shook uh, reading some of that material, integrating it and seeing it. So my own sense had always been that this was the foundation of Jung's work, and with the book available, the next thing I did after a couple of readings of the Red Book is go back into my notes in the collected works and, and see how they integrated. And it became apparent to me that to understand Jung's later work, particularly the works he published after 1944, his last four great works, which I call his, his last quartet, you know, Psychology of the Transference, Ion, Answer to Job, Mysterium Conjunctionis, those great four last works, that came after his near-death visions in 1944. Mm -hmm. To understand those works, you have to contextualize them with his experience in the Red Book, because that is the final exegesis of the Red Book in Jung's collected works, I, I think. So my 
my focus in the things I've been writing and lecturing about, doing seminars about, is uh, on how this is a foundational work in understanding Jung, but even more important, what it was the man was doing. And I, you know, as someone who has said, it's reading the black books, it's really unclear what he was doing, other than he was apparently in intense dialogue, a dialogic encounter, and sometimes visionary, sometimes verbal, with uh, anotherness, a psychic fact which he thought was autonomous, spoke with its own voice, and to him was real. It was irrational for sure, but reason and unreason, the rational and the irrational, are a conjunctio of, of human consciousness, consciousness and unconscious, coming together. So I've, you know, what I've seen is that the the Red Book went through a hermeneutic, uh, an interpretive process for you. I mean, the first thing that happened to Jung is he had the visions. There in 1913, it broke open, and it went on intensely for about oh seven months. He, those are the black books, his nightly encounter with this material from October on through the late spring and early summer of 1914. And his first hermeneutic interpretive task was to take the visionary material and record it. And he said he did so uh, voluntarily, not changing what had happened to him, even though it embarrassed him, it offended him at times. How he was writing this stuff, he did it. And then the war broke out, he saw that some of this material actually had been prophetic in his own view of things of the coming of this great world disaster. Then he wrote the manuscript, the first hundred or thousand page handwritten manuscript he did in the fall of 1914 after the war broke out. That was sort of a second hermeneutic step because he took the visions and he added to them interpretive layers, a second layer of material. And he thought maybe he was done with that manuscript in hand, which is Liber Primus essentially. And then, and part of Liber Segundus, and then in 1915, the vision started again. Philemon re reappeared, and an entirely new visionary experience developed, now with a much deeper understanding on Jung's part. And this is the period in which he started identifying what was happening with him with a tradition, a Gnostic tradition, an ancient religious tradition, and a, um, as, as, as Thomas said, a golden chain of visionary experience reaching back across two millennia through Hermeticism, through alchemy, all the way back to the, the beginning of the Christian age. And he saw that indeed we were at the beginning of a new aeonial change, a 2000 year change that we were at the beginning of a new epoch. And the red book, the new book for that new age was his beginning statement. In the 1920s, he talked about the book as a revelation. So in that, in that, uh, my, paper, I talked about Jung and the prophet puzzle, because this has always been a question. I mean, was Jung a prophet? Well, what the hell is a prophet? Uh, you know, what is that? It's a bizarre ancient word. But there are points in this book where he talks about having visions 800 years into the future. And so I talked about that in my essay, just, just to make people think about it. What was going on in the consciousness of this person? Later in life, he talked about the psyche as as being beyond the time-space continuum, as the source of everything to which everything again returns. In his last thoughts and memories, dreams, and reflections, he talks about the ultimate question being, are we related to something eternal? And most certainly in Jung's mind, we were, and that psyche is such a thing. So <clears throat> in the Red Book, I don't see it in and of itself as an independent fact. It's a fact interwoven with an experience and interwoven with a series of hermeneutic steps, of interpretive steps by Jung as he dealt with it. So then he, he had the draft manuscript. Then he got the big book, started painting in the book, writing, transcribing, never finished it, but continued. He thought about publishing it. By the end of the 1920s, he saw he could not publish it. No one would understand this thing. And of course, they would not. They are having a bit of difficulty now, uh, 100 years after the fact. And he switched into a second phase. During the late 20s through the 30s, Jung was looking intensely at other religious, spiritual, prophetic, 
traditions, you know, the, the you know, but you know, the, the, the meditations of Patanjali's, the, you know, St. Ignatius, Ignatius of Loyola's writing said, he was looking at Meister Eckhart. He was looking at, you know, some of the stranger figures of history, looking for experiences of the reality of the imaginal, such as he had had. And then in the mid 1930s, he hits alchemy as a mother load of imaginative material that he could relate to his experience. And when Philemon reappeared in September of 1915 in the in the Red Book, Philemon said to Jung, and this is in the in the Black Book journals, uh, Sonu Shamdasani put this in the footnotes, uh, Philemon announced to Jung that Hermes was his daimon, his demon, his, his you know, deity or whatever. Daimon's a better word. Um, and Jung came to encounter the fact that indeed this hermetic tradition what, which was base of the alchemical tradition, led back on a golden chain of experience that led all the way back to the beginning of the last uh, aeon, you know, many years ago. So there you have a little bit of a lecture. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Lance. That was, uh, as always, brilliant and uh, to the point. And um, I think that you've given uh, the audience a lot to think about there, and they can go to your essay and read uh, read it uh, in uh, more carefully and in detail. Um, I think Lance is one of our outstanding authors. He will also be with us in uh, at Aranos at the symposium uh, next April. Um, uh, we've we've had so far, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Thomas, 54 authors in the three volumes that, that have been published. And uh, <clears throat> they all circle around themes similar to what Lance has just been talking about. Uh, some go in, in um, other directions, but the common theme, I think, uh, threading its way through all the essays is the... Um, uh, uh, fascination with and uh, respect for uh, the imaginative faculty in the human being that is so uh, strongly um, exemplified in the Red Book. Uh, the Red Book is a world-class piece of imaginative literature in my mind. And like the others, Dante, um, Shakespeare, uh, you mentioned Meister Eckhart, the great mystics. Uh, the uh, imagination soars, uh, and Jung is running uh, after it to catch up and trying to understand it. It it's carries him away at certain points, and he's trying to subject it to his rational understanding as a modern man. And so you get the commentaries, and there's a lot of puzzlement in it. Uh, um, Jung is confused. He doesn't understand what's happening to him. It's like he's going through a metamorphosis process and it's gotten ahead of him. Um, but that's the power of imagination. And uh, a lot of the authors comment on uh, Jung's rediscovery of the value and the importance of imagination uh, in spiritual life generally, but also in uh, intellectual life where in modern postmodern times the rational faculty has dominated to such an extent that uh, analytic thinking and um, uh, rational thinking as we know it in the scientific um, uh, departments has completely squeezed out the uh, the value and the uh, respect for uh, imaginative uh, knowledge that's gnosis Yes. Gnosis well, is well, the well, knowledge but, of imagination. But that's what, you know, the, whether Jung was a Gnostic or not is a, is a useless argument. Jung identified Gnosis as understanding that the psyche is real. That was the secret, he says, of the Gnostics. And that is what Jung took. And so, yes, there is this importance in realizing the imaginative uh, faculty and the unconscious and the ability to reach in through imaginative functions into things unseen, unknown, that are yet real. But there's a second step in that which Jung took, which is that thing that is real is eternal. It is a source from which we come and to which we return. It is transpersonal. It is not an um, a epiphenomenon of our brain, that we swim in psyche. Psyche does not swim in our brains. 
this that sort of an image was really a realization he felt was vital to this coming age if we will survive our rationality our technos our technology our 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 material creativeness also an imaginative function but we mm. take that imagination and we work it into money work it into webs to catch mm. sparks of gold mm -hmm. and put them in our pockets that you know i when you look at you know imagination reaches far beyond the individual into the imagination we 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 meet in well, in cinema, right around the turn of the millennia, there were several films like Matrix and others uh, I, I could name, I won't now, but where these imaginative visions are coming out in cinematic form that are really, some of them really globsmack people, or apocalyptic visions of this technological future mm -hmm. taking away the human soul, taking away humanity. And I see those imaginative statements as also statements of this deeper fact speaking to us so it's not just personal but i think you know of course we are each alone in our individuality with our own imaginative you know facts we have nothing but that subjective ability but in collective and that's what i think is so valuable about about these books here you've brought together the visions of 54 or more authors looking at this material bringing their own visions to it and i think that's uh, an incredibly valuable work Yes, I agree. And I do have a question for you, Dr. Owens, when you were talking about how Jung had this idea that he didn't want the Red Book published because nobody would understand it. And I'm wondering if we do understand it because we've read Jung, but he didn't know that back then. It's, you know, it's an oros boros. It's like the circle. of the, <laughs> That's a good point, Laura. <laughs> it's, it's the head eating the tail. And yes, yes. Lance, and you would not have been able to read the Red Book the way you the way you have been able to if you hadn't studied Jung backwards uh, in preparation. Absolutely correct, and that's <laughs> and that is what Jung was doing. You see, I mean, it, 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 after reading the Red Book, it became absolutely apparent to me that all of Jung's later works were his attempt to create a language which could cope with the fact of what he had been through in the Red Book. That it was a that the, I mentioned these layers of his hermeneutic. This is my own construct, my own mental construct. His his interpretive layers. That each of these layers, each of these things he did from the 1920s onward, was an attempt to bring people to a way of looking back and reading that book. He couldn't publish it until he had developed a language, a hermeneutics, a scope of study of the psyche, a realization of its reality, and not just conceptually, but through psychoanalytical work with people. So people became aware. And then all, all of a sudden we get to this place a hundred years later where that groundwork, that language has been established. And now we can take that language conceptual and take it back to the experiential source. I also see that the Philemon Foundation is in the process of publishing the black books. And I was wondering if any of you had any insights into that, if there were going to be any surprises. Um, th there probably won't be any surprises. The black books, as last I heard, and Murray, you may know more about this. Uh, the, the black books are scheduled to be out this summer. Uh, and I've heard that they're pretty much ready to go. But the... 50% of the black books are transcribed pretty much verbatim into the red book. There's another 50% there that we haven't seen. But throughout the red book, I mean, when Sonu did the edit, Sonu Sham, Dr. Sham, Sham Dasani did the editing of the red book, he had no idea whether one, the thing would ever get in print as he worked on it for those 10 years. And second, he had no idea if the black books would ever be seen. So if you read Sonu Shamdasani's 1,500 footnotes to the Red Book, you'll find that throughout that, those footnotes, he gives a guided tour of what's in the Black Books. Mm -hmm. So you can read the footnotes and you can get, and he, when there are places in the Red Book where he left something out that he'd put in the Black Books, you look in the footnote and there Sonu has the complete passage from the Black Books. So if you're the sort of person who reads 1,500 footnotes, you got a pretty good guided tour of the Black <laughs> yes. Books. I saw, I, Sonu, uh, excuse me, I saw Sonu uh, at the Congress in Vienna, and again, I, I um, 
express my gratitude for those footnotes. Uh, I think he did say that the black books would be published next year. I think there maybe there's been a delay. But I, I agree with you, uh, Lance. I don't think there will be surprises, but who knows? Um, uh, they will, I think, give a further um, uh, context because Jung did leave out parts of his uh, experience and commentary, maybe not experience, but commentaries that he had written in the black book. So I think it will add a further context. I don't think it will be as popular or as widely bought and read um, as the red book. Um, what we well, haven't really talked about are the pictures. The art in the red book? The art, yes. Uh, and it has been appreciated as a work of art by quite a number of people. It's been shown, uh, it actually was featured at the uh, Venice Biennale a couple of years ago at the entrance of the Biennale. They had the red book in a case uh, with pictures uh, from the red book around the room. And, um, and Christian the, Geyer. Sorry, is this the the original copy of the Red Book? Yes, that was in Venice at the Biennale. It was in Venice, last. and is it currently on display anywhere? The original Red Book? No, uh, it's in a bank vault in Zurich, okay. I think. It it was in uh, in California um, earlier this year. They had a art and psyche conference at Pacifica and Santa Barbara, and they took the Red Book out there, but it's very expensive to insure it when you travel with it. Uh, it has to be, I think it's estimated worth is something like $50 million or something. Right. It's like, <laughs> well, it, it, it is indeed priceless. Yeah, that's, it's that's priceless. The, that's the yeah. point. But, you know, the, with, the, with regard to the art, this is one thing that Sonu said when the book was first published, is read the text first. Don't look at the art. And of course, no one does that because mm -hmm. the art is just overwhelming. But the thing that Sonu's also, or Dr. Shamdasani has also made clear, and he is editing the black books, is that most of the art after Liber Primus, uh, and maybe a, you know, the, the first part of it, and then a bit of the second part, most of the art comes in synchrony with subsequent material that developed for Jung that's not in the red book. So the black books, the one thing they will give us is some of the material behind the images in that book, which become increasingly abstract, but actually often relate to specific visionary material in the black books, material that Jung encountered after 1916 and onward, and then added these images, because he was painting in this book up through 19, well, I think the last image is probably at the end of the 1920s, but it really slowed down around 1924, 25, but from 16 yeah. to 25, mm -hmm. most of that stuff in there, the paintings, are actually related to material in those black books. And they have a kind of story of their own. Uh, they're yes. not terribly related to the text in the Red Book. Uh, but they're they not are, after Yeah, yeah. But, but they're they fascinating. Are and, and Jung put a great deal of energy and uh, care into into those paintings. They're, they're quite amazing. Mm -hmm. I always and, wondered are, how, how he learned how to paint. Was he taught or is he just had a no he's self-taught there yeah. there is another book um you should get uh, jill Melick on your uh, uh in a podcast sometime laura mm -hmm. jill Melick has written a book um uh, it was published last year or earlier this year called the red book hours okay. discovering cg young's art mediums and creative process and it's her book is just about the size of the red book and it has um uh, it's a it's a very very detailed analysis of how Jung created the art in the Red Book, the and kind of, course, of brushes he used, the kind of paint he used, um, the kind of um, paper he used. Uh, it's a fascinating book. And you'll also want to get the book that was the the center of that uh, April symposia at uh, in in Santa Barbara, which is the art of C. G. Jung. Yes, yes. Because. She, that your question is essentially answered in in that book, which relates not only the art in the red book, but all the stuff he was doing on the side, his little carvings and right. early works he did. They're all in there. I know the one thing we haven't touched on are the accusations and the rumors that uh, Jung was psychotic and he was a madman. And I was particularly taken by the depiction of that on a popular television series. They said that, you know, Jung was crazy and a madman and a psychotic. And so, and that's, <laughs> you know, on network television. So there are millions of people seeing that. And it, 
it's disturbing that that's the impression that the general public might have of the Red Book and of Jung. So I was wondering Steve, if, if, yeah, if any of you uh, wanted to. Dr. Buser as a psychiatrist. Steve, can you address that question? Yeah, yeah. As a psychiatrist, I deal a lot with psychosis. Yeah, and in the field of addiction, we see methamphetamine induced psychosis, schizophrenia, all kinds of things. Um, he certainly wasn't psychotic unless you broaden the definition you know, of it in the sense of psychosis is a, I see it as a range that the most unhealthy range of psychosis is schizophrenia, paranoia, delusions, etc. But you could theoretically look at psychosis as the realm of interior, interior elements, you know, looking at intuition, um, visions, imagery, and to that degree, Jung, of course, was brilliant. He was able to suspend his rational mind and dive deep into the imaginative, into the images, into the intuitions, into the archetypal you know, world. And that probably does border and blur with psychosis, um, but it was a descent into that realm that wasn't a clinical psychotic you know, space, um, but diving into the the murky, yeah, imaginative world that can be quite scary yeah, at times. You know, Jung said in the in the Red Book, he said, you know, the the key is you have to do your night work and you have to do your day work. And right. the day the day work was still seen during this entire period five patients a day, serving for many months on military duty during World War One with the Swiss Army, taking care of a family in a very complex family situation, shall we say. And uh, and still lecturing, still writing, and then at night after dinner he would go and do his his thing, whatever his thing was. There's actually there's a place in the Black Book Sonu Sham Dasani has talked about where Jung is writing in the Black Book and all of a sudden he stops and says, "I can't write anymore tonight. I've run out of tobacco." <laughs> right. I mean, if that's psychosis, I don't know. <laughs> it's definitely right. nicotine right. addiction. That's a wonderful point. His his functionality. He was you know, extraordinarily functional you know, during that time. And true psychosis, you would lose your ability to function adequately in society. And of course, Jung was functioning on an extraordinary level with his publications, with his teaching, with his clinical duties. So yeah, Lance, you're, you're quite right. You really couldn't be psychotic in any traditional sense of the word and still maintain that level of functionality. I think there were uh, there was probably a period uh, late 1913 1914 that that Jung was <clears throat> not at his top form function, uh, functionally in the world but I think that passed and he um he was able to get his legs under him again there's an essay in volume 3 by Toshio Kawai uh, the Japanese analyst who is now president of the IAP a very interesting article on Jung's ego strength as shown in the Red Book. Um, and he um, he tells a story of his father, Hayao Kawai, who, was, um, who came to the Jung Institute in the 1950s uh, to train uh, and introduced uh, Jungian psychology into Japanese culture after his graduation. And when he came to Zurich, one of the teachers there asked him, aren't you impressed? By, uh, by the uh, imaginative uh, and, uh, you know, the, the fantasies uh, of, uh, of Jung in, in his work. And he said, I'm not as impressed by the fantasies as I am by his ego, um, that he could entertain these fantasies and not go under with them, that he could do something with them, uh, that he could create a book uh, that is uh, in... Uh, in a in a class of world literature that uh, stands with the best, um, that I think is um, uh, the t uh, a living proof and a testimony to his uh, ego strength uh, uh, that could endure, contain the suffering, uh, the passion, uh, all these um, very vivid experiences he had, come through it and make such good use of it. Now, is this a unique and rare individual, Jung? I mean, we, we think he is, but 
is this seen in other people? That level of ego strength that can endure this and, and go through something like that? Or was he just so unusual? There aren't say, many other red books around. Right. Yeah, I would I would say that Jung is a extraordinary, unique individual. It's what Eric Neumann, one of his most insightful students uh, and the founder of analytical psychology in, in Israel, uh, called a, a um, the um, the great individual. Yeah. The great individual, and across time, you know we. We, we are so willing to equalize uh, human potential and put everyone on the same level. But there are times in history when extraordinary people speak and extraordinary people appear. They have extraordinary messages and they share them. Um, and few of us can uh, claim to be such or if we do claim, make such claims, it's vast inflation and probably psychopathology. Sometimes a person comes along who really is great. And uh, unfortunately, that's how I see Jung. I do too. And I don't think Jung claimed it for himself, but other people who met him um, could see that in him. There's a, a story about a trip that he took with, I um, uh, forget his name, a professor at the Eteha. And they went, to, uh, first they went to Palestine and then they went to Egypt and they the boat docked in um uh, in a port in Egypt, uh, and there was a fortune teller uh, in, a, in a stand there, and they had they th they said, "Well, let's go and and uh, see what he has to say." So he looked at them, and he read uh, Jung's uh, friend's palm and said a few things, and then he looked at Jung's palm and he looked in his face and he said, "This is a great man." Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think the people who were close to Jung recognized it. And then, of course, they, many of them were criticized for worshiping him, and it was a cult and all of that. But you do build cults around exceptional personalities, and he did have a very exceptional personality. But it will really be the test of time. Will Jung still be read 100 years from now? His Red Book is read 100 years after he produced it. Will it be read 100 years from now? Will his collected work stand the test of time? Uh, and his um, his reputation. Uh, we don't know that. We I believe it will, but um, I'm with Lance. I think that's a great place to leave it. I want to thank all of you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for producing this incredibly valuable series of books, um, which will continue on and maybe get even bigger. So thank you all for your time today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. My deepest thanks to Drs. Murray Stein, Thomas Arst, Stephen Buser, and Lance Owens for their time and cooperation with this episode. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J U N G, dot com for more information on everything that was discussed here today. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and now on iHeartRadio. Additionally, on the website, you'll find a schedule of upcoming talks by our guests and our new masterclass page, where you can register for online video courses that you can start anytime, go at your own pace, and have lifetime access to the material please visit speakingofyoung.com for more details. With special thanks to Chiron Publications, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. <laughs>